Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Susan Edgeman Levitan. I'm the director of the Stokel Center for Primary Care Innovation at Mass General. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to our second um, Aging Positively program. Um, we have wonderful speakers today. But before we get started, I just want to share a few of the housekeeping rules. So one thing that we think is very important is that if you are not comfortable being on screen or you want to change your name on your little screen box, please feel free to change your name or remove your name. And it's also perfectly fine to turn your camera off. Um, we also ask that you don't share any personal medical information in the chat um, because anything that is in the chat is visible to all of us. And so we want to protect your privacy there as well. Um, we are, everyone is muted. Um, although we may unmute people if you have questions or you can put your questions into the chat when our speakers finish their presentations. So with that, I am going to introduce our speakers today, Dr. Matt Russell, who is the Clinical Director of Geriatric Medicine and is a practicing geriatrician and palliative care doctor in our geriatric medicine practice, and also Joanne doyle Petrangolo, who is a pharmacist who's going to be sharing a lot of information with us today about medications. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Russell. Great. Thank you, Susan. And thanks to everybody who's uh, viewing this. It is um, our, we're still trying to tweak our model to figure out the best way to reach folks about geriatric concepts that are important for folks aging with HIV. Uh, so I'm just going to start. Is this the good slideshow? And that's not the right one. All right. Uh, share screen and here we go. Are you seeing my regular view or this? No, that looks great. All right, excellent. Um, so what I was hoping we could talk about today is um, talking about polypharmacy, its consequences, oops, its consequences, strategies to improve polypharmacy and offer resources around uh, medication affordability. So first of all, when we talk about polypharmacy, it's a great drag name, but that's not what, uh, what it is. It's uh, the old definition is really concurrent use of multiple medications by an individual. So commonly five or more medications. Um, but what we really wanna talk about, is not the absolute number, it's that there are more medications than are clinically indicated. And this problem is not unique to the HIV population. Um, about 15% 15 of the US population accounts for over 30% of all prescription medication use. And that in addition to this, 68% use over-the-counter medicines or supplements with their prescriptions, with one in eight using five or more supplements. And we can give a whole talk on the purported benefits of, of uh, supplements and also the way that it can impact our appetites and pill burden. So how big of a problem is it? In people living with HIV, uh, 23 to 39% um, have polypharmacy. Um, and this is higher than in the non-HIV population. But again, as we're aging with HIV, we have to understand that it's also older adults can have polypharmacy. So it's a bit of a you know, convergence of, of, of two at-risk populations. But we don't start out taking 15 medicines in a day. It happens over time. And there are many reasons why this happens. And so a lot of what you'll hear about in geriatric medicine, one of the pillars of what we do is, is medication reconciliation, helping to figure out how these medicines came on board, what are they indicated for? Have they been on at the right uh, duration? Do we need to take them off? And then patients may have an attachment to a medication. For example, we will often see people on medicines for diabetes at, at higher levels than we would recommend, but they've 
always been on these medicines. And so we have to often speak about how our bodies change and the medications may be less effective or more harmful as we age. So from the healthcare side of things, one of the biggest problems is that we have a Tower of Babel going on with many different providers. And many of those providers are also prescribing medicines. And these all get fed to your pharmacy. But what if they get sent to your mail order pharmacy and then your local pharmacy? Who's, does, is anyone tracking all of these uh, medication prescriptions? Because sometimes if you get your care at one hospital system, you may have a medication list over there. But if you get yours at, at hospital center B, there might be a different list. And so we ask ourselves, well, which is the right list? And then certainly our patients might say, which is the right list? There are unintended side effects to all medications potentially. And this can be things that we may not know about a specific drug interacting with another one. And that's why I always encourage our patients to be advocates for themselves and say, hey, can you please make sure this doesn't interact with anything? Um, uh, we have guideline recommendations for many disease states, particularly cardiovascular disease, where we have medications that are recommended to reduce mortality risk. And sometimes those medications can build up in terms of the number of medicines and can be an extreme pill burden to the patient. And even though it's sort of guideline directed therapy, it's guideline directed therapy out of context with the rest of the patient's conditions in life. Uh, we will often try to avoid, especially in geriatrics, we will often try to avoid having to add another pill and look into things, non-drug options like physical therapy or things like acupuncture or uh, massage to minimize the risk of having to add additional medicines. Now, as we get older, we accumulate chronic conditions. And so that means we might will likely be on more medications than we were when we were younger. But even if you have a PhD in, in philosophy, or even you're a doctor, um, it can be very confusing when you're put on many different medicines because you say, well, why am I on this medicine? And what is this for? And, or I, the doctor put me on it. I don't really know. I just trust that the doctor did it. Um, there's a pill for every ill and we're a pill taking country. And so this can also be one of the things that, hey, I saw this ad on TV. There was a woman running across a field chasing a butterfly. It sounds like that's the medicine for me. And I'll say, I have no idea what it treats except for maybe helping catch butterflies, but let me look it up. And that's the direct to consumer advertising that can also confound the relationship between a, a patient and a provider, especially around the perceived need for a medicine. We all are at risk of self-medicating, uh, whether that is, you know, oh, I think I'm feeling low energy. I think I'll take a vitamin B tablet. I heard that's good for you or vitamin D. That's all the rage now on TikTok. Everyone's saying take mega doses of vitamin D. Um, and those things can be dangerous if they're not taken in a supervised way. Certainly using substances like alcohol, sedatives or even street drugs can definitely interact with how other medicines are metabolized and increase a person's risk of harm. So what happens the more medicines you're on? If you've ever had to take a four times a day antibiotic and you've actually completed it, the full 10 day course, well done you. But the majority of us don't actually see it through to completion. That's just because the more meds you take, the more, the more times a day, the more opportunity for omissions and missing it because we have to live our lives. We don't necessarily sit by the timer to take our next round of meds. And I know many people who are watching this probably experienced a time in their life when they actually did have to sit with a clock and a timer for their next medication dosing. Um, there are many medical conditions for which medications are needed. And drug-drug interactions are one of the big challenges. I will meet a patient and do an intense medication review, and then I'll have to ask one of my pharmacy colleagues to help me 
to understand if medicine A interacts with medicine B, that we have programs to do that. I'd encourage everyone to ask your pharmacist uh, to, to, to review your medicines, to make sure that you're taking uh, medicines that don't interact negatively with each other. Um, and what we also know is the more medicines you're on, the greater the likelihood of a hospitalization or another adverse outcome. So we definitely are always in geriatric land attending to this concern. As I, as I sort of alluded earlier, our body makeup changes as we get older. Our lean muscle goes down, our fat levels increase, and our what's called free water or our body water it decreases. And that can impact how the medicines dis distribute in the body. Similarly, we have changes in our absorption, in our gut motility, how fast things travel, and that can impact how much of a medicine we might actually be getting in our system. On the other end, getting medicines out of our system requires kidney and liver mechanisms to metabolize it. Both those organs have age-related changes that slow down our metabolism. And so what you might have taken, what dose you might have taken when you were 52 might be very different now that you're 72. So older adults are more sensitive to both positive and negative effects of medicines. There's a narrower window of, of, of safety to toxicity. And more in the older group of people, medication effects can often be thought of as, oh, that's just someone aging. They're getting a little confused. They're tired all the time, or they're unsteady, or they're not able to sleep, or they're not eating as much because you know they're, they're just older. But then we find out they're tired because they're on so many blood pressure pills that their blood pressure is now 90 over 40. And they just, and when they stand up, it drops even lower. Or they're on medications that cause dry mouth that then make them not want to, to eat much because you need saliva to help digest and enjoy your meals. Um, Many times people are put on classes of medicines like antidepressants, and we say, oh, take it at night. But these drugs are very, behave very differently in individuals. And what might make one person more sleepy might make another person more, um, more awake, more peppy. And so we have to figure out what time of day makes the most sense. We talk about the common causes of death in this country, and we'll say, you know, uh, cancers, heart disease, strokes, uh, kidney disease, uh, dementia. But adverse drug events are listed as the fifth leading cause of death in older adults. So that's why this is a cornerstone of geriatric management, because we know the risks of this. I'm going to pass this over now to my colleague, Joanne Petrangolo, who's going to take it from here. Thanks, Matt. So one of the things that we also have to keep in mind is that if we are taking a lot of medications, there's also the risk for medication errors. So if a patient has a very complex dosing schedule, so if they're taking meds like five times a day, that certainly can come into play in terms of you know um, how quickly or how they're often they're supposed to be taking meds. Maybe they lose track. Maybe they end up taking like double the dose because they couldn't remember what time they actually took the med. Um, another point of care um, that we find you know a little bit cumbersome for some of our patients is when they're transitioning to different levels of care. So if they were hospitalized and then went to rehab or from rehab to home you know, quite often the medications can change. So in that transition period, there is the opportunity for dosages to change and maybe something um, will end up, um, can fall by the wayside. So keeping a close eye on what the medication list is during those times of transition is important. Also having multiple prescribing providers. So if somebody was seen in the hospital and there was a resident that wrote for it or another attending that wrote for an inpatient, um, but then they were transitioned home. Um, if they also have a lot of specialists. So if there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen, there's opportunities for things to kind of um, 
get a little discombobulated in terms of what the correct dosing may be or the med for the patient. And then certainly like any type of, you know, change in metabolism, um, as Matt had just talked about, the changes in body chemistry can certainly make a difference in terms of how the medication is absorbed or eliminated through the body. And that could lead to an adverse event as well. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to share this. Um, this was one of my most complicated medication reviews that I had to do for a patient. And the reason why it was so complicated is Yes, there's a lot of meds on here, um, but this patient was very complicated and had multiple providers. So going back to what we just said in, in the previous slide. So this patient had a primary care physician here at Mass General. There were three or four specialists within the system, and then they had an outside provider as well for the dialysis care. And so just trying to get everybody all on the same page, um, it, it literally took months <laughs> to be able to go through this list. Like I started in January and it was finally like better by like April because there were a lot of different medication related problems that were identified, but then we needed to make sure that those providers were gonna follow up on it. So in my email and um, you know, responding to the physicians, I had, you know, Dr. So-and-so, can you comment on this? And then I had each doctor, I, I, you know, I had a certain line or a certain sentence for clarification because there, there were a lot of moving parts with this. And um, after completing this review, I actually put a note in the patient's chart going forward, please send me an email before anybody prescribes anything. Um, not only looking for, you know, drug interactions, but just like overall appropriateness for the Medicaid, for the particular patient, knowing his complex regimen. Um, I mean, as we see here, and honestly, I lost track of, I think there's probably about like 30 something meds on here. Um, but just making sure they weren't going to interact with the HIV meds or some of the cardiovascular meds. Um, it was certainly very complicated that we wanted to make sure that we had the safest plan in place for this particular patient. Next slide, please. So as those were a lot of pills, we can go through the whole list, Matt, it's fine if it, it's listed. Um, so one of the things that come to mind when I look at this is how does the patient manage all these medications? So what type of system do they have? Do they use a pill box? How do they organize those things? How do we know that they're using their medications correctly? Are they really taking it twice a day? Or if it is a three times a day, are they really do using it three times a day? Are they having any side effects? Are there any drug interactions? Because certainly looking at that list, there were quite a few drug interactions. Can they afford their meds? And then the other question that I always ask my patients is, tell me how you feel about your meds. Because this really, you know, getting to the crux of like how they really feel and how they want to approach it will really kind of help determine like what their goals are and how they want to be able to manage their own health. Um, so there's just a lot of moving parts with this that we want to make sure that our patients really understand what's going to be in their best interest. So there are certainly challenges within medication compliance, you know, understanding what the patient's goals are, you know. There are some patients that they don't mind taking 18 meds a day if it's going to be able to keep them alive and, you know, they'll be able to go see their grandkids, you know, those sort of things. Um, if they, they know this is what they need to do to stay alive. Whereas other patients may say, give me the most minimal amount of meds so that way I can stay alive. So really just understanding what the patient's goals are and how they want to approach it will make a huge difference. Um, you know, we see that, you know, on that previous slide, the patient was on take was taking certain meds like three or four times a day. So we know that, you know, Matt had just mentioned if you took an antibiotic and you were supposed to take it four times a day, sometimes we're not always taking it four times a day. If, if we do, we're, we're having a good day, but sometimes people may be only taking it two or three times a day. So we know that the more pills somebody has to take, the less apt they are to be able to actually remember to take them. They just feel completely overwhelmed many patients feel like maybe they're taking meds five times a day and their whole life revolves around taking pills. So, you know, really trying to streamline the regimen to maybe like three times a day instead of five. So really just trying to get at the overall management to help their improve their overall quality of life. 
The other thing too, that we always, um, we can go back on, there we go. Um, the other thing that we also need to keep in mind is that if the patients are, you know, aging, certainly there may be some memory or some concentration difficulties. So if they have all those pills that they have to manage and put into a pill box, how are they going to remember which one is supposed to be morning? Are they going, is it supposed to be afternoon? Do they remember to take their meds? So, you know, we have certain um, tools in place to be able to help the patients manage that. The other thing I want to mention too is about substance abuse. So we have many patients who may have a history of substance abuse with either alcohol or other medication or other um, drugs of abuse. And if they're they're kind of bogged down with those issues, it may be difficult for them to be engaged in their care to remember to take those meds. Um, or if they have mental health issues. So if they have depression or bipolar, one of the things that we really try to do is make sure that they're taking the meds for their mental health and or substance abuse. And once they're, they get those on board, then they're able to remember to use the meds for some of their other maintenance conditions, whether it's heart failure or emphysema. And then certainly side effects. You know, many patients, if they're taking that many meds, they're going to be at risk for side effects. And are we treating another side effect with another medication? Or is there anything else that we can do to minimize that effect? Decrease the dose, decrease the frequency, or is do we still need to keep that medicine? So these are some of the things that we just like to keep in mind when we're looking at the overall pill burden in the med list. Next slide, please. So we are patient patient centric care. We want patient empowerment. So these are just a few to, um, tips of the trade that we want to share with our patients. So that way they help feel engaged in their own care. So knowing what the names of the meds are, why they're using them, and then also having a medication list. So on the right hand side here is actually a list that I created for our patients that explains what the meds that they take in the morning what the indication is, what the drug is, the dose, and how often they're supposed to take it, or whether with or without food. If you're not able to get to somebody to make a list as such, I mean, I have a lot of patients who have, they're very computer savvy and they're able to do it themselves. Otherwise, you can ask your doctor to print out the list from Epic and it would list all of the medications. And then you can write next to it, this is for my blood pressure, this is for my cholesterol. So having that list on you and keeping it in your wallet or another place that you have frequently, um, if you wanna keep it on your phone, put it as a notes thing on your cell phone, that's another good way to always have that list on you. So if something happened, people would know what medications that you were taking. Also, it's important to make sure that your providers know about the medications that you take. So if you are seeing somebody who's outside the system or another specialist, you wanna make sure that they're aware that you're taking these other meds to prevent you know, duplicate therapy. So you don't wanna be taking the same, you don't wanna be taking both like Lipitor and Crestor at the same time when they're both used for cholesterol. So we wanna make sure that you're preventing duplicate therapy. So if a new medication is prescribed, you wanna make sure that you ask what it's being used for, how to take it, what are some of the side effects and will it interact with any of the other medications that you're going to be taking? So you can certainly ask your physician at the time that he's prescribed, he or she are prescribing the medicines, or you can also ask the pharmacist when they're providing the medication to you. Pharmacist that is part of their job is to counsel med patients about their meds. So this is certainly um, one of the things that you want to be able to do to educate yourself. Another important aspect is always ask before starting any over-the-counter products, herbals, or supplements. So there are OTCs and other supplements that can interact with your prescription meds. And so we want to make sure that we prevent any of those things from recurring. There are certain herbals, and I can think of like ginseng and ginkgo biloba, that interact with things like warfarin or coumadin and they can have an increased risk of bleeding. So you wanna make sure that if you wanna start a new product that you ask, the med you ask the pharmacist before taking it. So if you're at a local chain pharmacy or an independent pharmacy and you see something on the shelf before you actually you know, ring it out, make sure that you ask somebody if it's gonna um, interact with any of the other meds or if it's appropriate. 
If there are any other side effects of your new meds or any existing meds, that's something else that you want to bring up because you don't want to be continuing to take the same medication and have a particular effect, whether it's dizziness or drowsiness, because if you're having some of those effects, it could lead to some type of event, hopefully not a hospitalization, but it's really important to mention those things to the doctor so that way you can prevent things from getting any worse. And then finally, having good patient education about how to use the meds. So whether it's knowing to take a pill with food, without food, is it better in the morning? Is it better at night? So understanding something basic like that, or maybe it's a new inhaler. There are a lot of new inhalers on the market right now. I mean, we used to have the old one where it's kind of like L-shaped and you press down and breathe it in. And now we have ones that are like, look like flying saucers and you have to press a couple of levers to get it open to breathe it in. Or another one that it's only one lever to breathe it in. So it's really important that you ask how to use these medicines so that way you have the best benefit from using it. Otherwise, if you're using it incorrectly, then you're not, you're not gonna get the benefit of the med. So we have a couple of systems in place to be able to help organize these meds. Yes, having a med chart is good, but also having that med chart that you can med chart to refer to when you're filling things like pill boxes um, or some of these other med dispensing devices. So there's a lot of different pill boxes. If you go to Google, I mean, there's like, a, I don't know, a thousand different hits on there. The one that I chose for this picture, just because we're limited for space, was one that can be used four times a day but you can get single strip ones that are just really for like once a day, you can get twice a day pill boxes. So these are a good way to kind of start out. These are good if you are taking, you know, greater than like six meds a day. Even if you were taking three meds a day, you could still use it for this. Many of our patients have arthritis. So if it's hard for them to open up some of the vials, you know, if they had to open like six vials every day, that would be a lot. So this way, if you set up the pill box for just once a week, you know, every Sunday, go fill your pill box, then you just have to pop the lid for that particular dose versus opening all the vials. So that's my usually, that's my stick when I try to get patients to use some of the pill boxes is that, is that it's less things that they have to actually open. Another tool that we use are blister packs. And so these are good for our patients that have multiple day dosing that they have to take. And it's really hard for them to, you know, physically put the pills in the box or they get confused in terms of what dose is going where. There are numerous pharmacies in Massachusetts and even out of state, there are a few mail order um, pharmacies that can do blister packs too, but there's numerous within Massachusetts that will provide these blister packs. Some of the pharmacies will charge a fee. And let me just tell you, like, it is worth it. It's worth every dime because they will organize all of these pills for you. You know, somebody is going through your med list and they are being very careful when they put all those different doses in, doses in for each of those dosing slots. So it is a little time consuming process, but it's worth the money to be able to have people actually do this for you. There are pharmacies that will provide it free to patients as well. Um, you can always reach out via email to our team afterwards, and then we can provide a list of some of those resources for the pharmacies that do that, if that's what you're interested in. And then finally, there's a med dispensing machine. Um, so the med dispenser, it's the one that looks like a big flying saucer. I'm going to date myself. I like Star Wars, so it kind of looks a little like the Millennium Falcon. Um, but we all, there's other dispensers. I think there's one that's like the Hero. And there's other companies that also have their own um, devices as well. Some of the other devices, um, and I don't want to promote any particular company, but they may charge for the service. So it may be like $60 a month or over $100 a month for the rental of the machine and for the subscription or you know to pay for the services of monitoring that you're actually using the dosages. Um, one of the challenges that we run into is that for like this machine here, many of our patients may not be able to put the pills into the actual slots. So they would either need a family member or somebody else to be able to fill the cartridges that go in there. Um, some of the elder service companies or services um, like Mystic Valley, um, Ethos, those sort of um, companies, 
they have um, somebody that you'd be able to partner with that would actually be able to come in and fill those slots for you. But that's one of the challenges that we have is who's going to be able to fill it for people. And then once they do, then you need to have a contact person that um, the company can reach out to in case you miss a dose. But these are certainly different tools that we offer for our patients to be able to help with their med management system. Other little thing I do want to mention is um, more so for the pill boxes and the blister packs. If a patient has difficulty remember to take their meds, we encourage them to set little alerts on their cell phone. So, you know, whether it's a smartphone or even a flip phone, you can go in and schedule, I want to have my pills, you know, the alarm go off at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. And that way it'll alert you to remember to take your meds to do it that way. Um, and that's kind of like a pre precursor to the med dispensing machine, which actually has the alarms go off for it. So next slide, please. So we have a great plan in place to be able to help manage all your meds. How do we know that you'll be able to afford them? So this is one of the challenges. I see this probably about 60% of my day is really around how can we help our patients with affordability. Just to kind of get a little bit of like understanding, very quick understanding of insurances. So if somebody is still currently working and has employer-based coverage, they may have something like Blue Cross Blue Shield, Harvard Pilgrim, Tufts, or Mass General Brigham Health Plan insurance. Those co-pays can vary anywhere between like 10 and like over $100. They may have deductibles associated with it. If the copay is expensive and it's a brand name med, there may be a manufacturer coupon available that you could use to help reduce the price. It might go down to like $10 or zero, so you could use that. Or if it's once you turn 65 and then you go on Medicare, there are Medicare Part D plans. I think there's like over 21 in Massachusetts right now. And those copays can vary anywhere between like zero to over $100 as well. Um, there, if those copays are high, one of the resources that we offer are either apply for Mass Health or Health Safety Net. Those are income-based programs, um, and then some of the Mass General Brigham plans are also for a lower income, and those copays would be zero or three sixty-five. So there's resources that way to be able to help with the overall copays. The other thing I do want to mention is that we're fortunate in Massachusetts that we have a program to be able to help specifically for HIV meds. It's called HDAP. So it's the Massachusetts HIV Drug Assistance Program. The phone number is listed there, 617-502-1700. And that helps with paying for a copays associated either with commercial or Medicare Part D plans. It is income-based. So for a single person, the income cutoff is around $75,000. And for a married couple, it would be over $102,000. So the income cutoff is actually quite high, um, which would be really good for many of our patients if they find that their co-pays um, are high or they have the deductible that go along with it. So it's certainly a good resource to look into. Next slide, please. So just some of the final like tips of the trade that we offer that we really encourage our patients to be able to utilize with us is if your office or the office or your physician has contact with a pharmacist, encourage them to review the med list twice a year to keep an eye for duplicate therapy, drug interaction, side effects. If there's a way to be able to have just one doctor write all of your prescriptions, sometimes that's not, all, not always feasible, but certainly uh, we encourage to just have one person kind of like overseeing what's really going on in general with the meds to make sure that there aren't any interactions and side effects. And then certainly if there's a way to be able to streamline your pharmacies. So sometimes I go on a patient's list and I see four or five different pharmacies listed because they have a local local pharmacy, an independent that might do their compounding, a mail order pharmacy. So there may be a few different ones. If there's a specialty pharmacy for a specialty med. So really trying to just stick with, you know, one entity. So that way to prevent like drug interactions and duplicate therapy is always good. And then also try to streamline the healthcare to just one system, because that way we can see what's going on. You know, I mean, if it's within like MGB, like if you go to Newton Wellesley, we can see the medication list there. But if it's like through the VA system or another system, then we may not be able to see that. So really trying to keep your care at one system is always um, a good idea. 
And then certainly asking your pharmacist and your provider to run, run a drug interaction check. When providers um, prescribe medications, there's usually a pop-up if there's any type of like drug interaction. So they may be able to see it at the time they're prescribing. If not, when the prescription is sent over to the pharmacy and they're running it, there would be a pop-up to see if there was a drug interaction there. But certainly just asking always really helps as well. Next slide, please. So just to kind of like wrap up, as patients age, we know that their health conditions may seem to, you know, increase. They may seem to have more medical problems. If they have more medical problems and they need, need to have more medications to use. So it's really important to work with your provider, whether it's a doctor, nurse practitioner, PA, um, and your pharmacist to find ways to better manage the medications that you take. So that way you can help organize the meds, streamline the regimen, so that way it may not be as cumbersome and overwhelming, and I'll certainly um, reaching out to make sure that you can afford the meds and then you can actually take them to be able to help improve your health. So thank you very much for your time today. Oh, my one last little, my little cartoon that I always like to add. Um, so this gentleman is at the pharmacy and it says, I have a few questions about my prescriptions. One makes me larger, one pill makes me small, and the ones you gave me last week don't do anything at all. And the pharmacist says, go ask Alice. So that just kind of goes back to the, I think it's Je Jefferson Starship song from the Go Ask Alice song. So I always Jefferson like Airplane. Jefferson Airplane. Well, they Jefferson did Jefferson airplane. Starship and like that. They were kind of yeah. going back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. It's in Wonderland. One yeah. other one other thing I just want to add to, and we didn't really talk about it, but Anytime you're in going in and out of a hospital, it's really important to make sure that you have a, a process of medical medicine recon, reconciliation. So it's always helpful to bring that list in to show the providers who are going to be taking care of you in the hospital what medicines you're taking. We also have to understand that sometimes I might be taking brand X inhaler but the hospital stocks brand Y, which is in the same family, but not the same thing. And then at discharge, brand Y is put in place instead of brand X. So at each inflection point in your care, when you're coming into or leaving the hospital, you want to make sure that someone is, someone's eye is on the ball to make sure that you're not taking double doses of a medicine and that your home list as you see it, is making sense with your discharge from the hospital list. And, um, and that's the other part where after a hospital stay, you want to make sure you connect with your provider to make sure that those drugs are still all aligned. Great. I'm going to stop sharing. All right. What questions do people have? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about when you are getting your medications at the pharmacy, is it always okay if you have questions or whatever to ask to speak to the pharmacist? Absolutely. It's actually um, a regulation that if a patient has a question about their medication, the pharmacist has to provide that, edu that counseling um, point to the patient. Okay, thank you. It is your right as a consumer to ask what the question, ask about the meds. And is that why when we pick up prescriptions, we often have to sign something that says we didn't have any questions? Exactly. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. So I'll just say thank you so much uh, for viewing this. I hope you found it informative. I, I want to thank Susan Edgman Levitan and Joanne Petrangolo for uh, facilitating and presenting respectively. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day.